everybody, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne and Disembodied Hands, Quindy, John, and Justin. Hey everybody, how's it going? How is the start of the week? It's a something or other. It's a it's a happy something or other. Oh, I have a dentist appointment today, so I'm like rrr, 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 rrr. grumpy day. Not that I fear them anymore, but I just like it's a disruption and it's like time I have to spend like sitting in an office and a and a chair while they look at my mouth and tisk at me. I used to fear the dentist. Then I had like six surgeries and I no, no longer fear the dentist. It's all relative. Oh, well, kitty cats. Yeah. This makes perfect sense. Only cats could have kept you from the stream. Only wild cats could have dragged you from the stream, Kernico. This is very um, in character, shall we say. <clears throat> very in character. So we're going to mix up our uh, base here. I want to get the rest of the horse bits uh, base coated and then I want to work more on the Appaloosa pattern. But since we uh, did a primer over that, I'm going to get that going. And we were using a slight, slightly darker version of 9109. We were using uh, 9109 with a drop of walnut. And then up to pure 9109. Walnut is just so uh, overwhelming that it very much darkens the 9109. Oh, uh oh, I have a big tube of paint attached to the top of my there. Ah, much better. There we are. And then I've got a highlight. And we used Griffin Golden Brown for our highlights on this because I wanted to try it out. It made a very realistic horse highlight. Griffin Golden Brown being part of the Adventure Colors Fast Palette there for you. I'm going to get this in focus a little closer to us all. There we go. That's a lot of driving for somebody in Europe. Like, I, I always have heard it characterized that you guys don't like long road trips or that you feel like what we think of as a wrong, long road trip, you think of as totally like crazy person road trip and... Uh, what we think of as a relatively short road trip, you think of as like eyebrow material. At least that's what my parents uh, experienced in Europe. Hey, lady. <clears throat> Six hours is pretty substantial. Is that three out and three back? Just thinning down my bases here. Since these are very high coverage colors, I can go pretty much a two to one or a five to two. I'm gonna mix up my shadow. And I'll mix up my midtone, I'll show you guys the transitions. Yesterday was a very quiet day. Everybody must have been working. So I don't have a lot of uh, profound transitions here with these colors since we're going very naturalistic on the horse. Um, I'm going with a much more, like you can see the transitions and you can tell this is actually more like a standard MSP triad. It's not quite as different as I'm inclined to go on my own. Um, fun, fun. Yeah, three each way isn't bad. I used to do that to do puppy evaluations in Oklahoma when I lived in Texas. I drive the three hours up to Oklahoma City, I do the puppy evaluation and then drive back. We have breeders in Oklahoma City area. All right, so now we're set. This is the this is the series of colors and what we have here, and you can see how much it changed it, but we have a four to one, um, 9109 ruddy leather plus walnut brown. You can see how the walnut has really taken that dark. Uh, it's because there's so much of a high load of black in the walnut. 
Then this is just pure ruddy leather, and then this is a 50-50 mix of uh, Griffin Golden Brown and ruddy leather. And then when I started the Appaloosa patterning, I added a brush full of Cairnstone. Or actually, I did a brush of each of these and then added a plus one drop of Cairnstone to make the color. So we'll do that in a bit because I want to maybe expand the Appaloosa pattern a little bit. I haven't quite decided. I need to put some darker spots in it to see, uh, see if it really reads. I do want it to read. Um, and so I may need to bring it a little further down the haunches so that you can see it better even from the front. Or we can just count it as back freehand um, since the front of the model and the side of the model here are the primary. This is a model with actually several primary viewing points instead of the front and back that we usually get. And primary viewing points are pretty much like the exciting angles of the model. When people pick up your model, they may not realize it, but the model's uh, composition itself will influence them on how they look at it. So with most 28 millimeter, you pick it up and you look at the front and the back. But with this guy, he's big enough and he's got like a viewing angle here that shows you his cool jewelry, but then he has a viewing angle here where he's looking directly at you. So his face direction is actually influencing your viewing angle. Then technically you have a back viewing angle, um, which we are, we're making it so because of the freehand with the Appaloosa pattern. So there will be something to look at back here. There'll be a reward for looking back here, if you, uh, if you will. And then uh, technically this is the most boring side here because you can't see the his face. This is technically the backside, even though you might think this is the backside. This is even more of a backside because there's nothing exciting going on here. Uh, everything on this side is kind of passive and the, the energy of the model is going in the other direction. So why this is important is just like how much attention you pay to various parts of your model. Um, if it's a viewing angle, then you should put something there uh, and pay attention to the detail there in order to get um, the viewer, give the viewer a reward, reward for looking at it. Uh, it is an obvious place to look to see more detail, but there isn't a whole lot going on here. So in order to make this exciting for the viewer or interesting for the viewer, we can put some details on here to make it so. Um, we can pay attention definitely to the things that are already here, like the armor and the weapon, but this is also a great place if we're going to do a tattoo, we could do it here on this shoulder. Um, so I think I, I do need to do some green stuff up here. This arm is really, really kind of not in, as you can see, there's a huge gap. Uh, so we definitely don't want to paint it like that. I have my green in the other room and I don't think I really want to deal with it. So what I'm going to do is, is work on the horse parts again today. Um, and perhaps the time after with the centaur, we will deal with green stuff because there's a little gap here and there's definitely a gap up here that I want before I start working on the skin. So that is, uh, that's my plan. I do feel like I need a little bit more coverage probably on my base coat here though. So I'm going to thicken up my shadow color. I went a little bit too uh, thin with it. Two to one is too thin for a base coat. It takes too long. So I'm just going to double it and go to four to one. There. And then we'll cover out the rest of the horse bits and start working up everything and uh, work more on the Appaloosa pattern. Also put some white socks on him, I think, this time. So we started, yeah, I mean, it's a smart thing. Any, I think any smart sculptor would do that, Dorman Deer. Um, any, these days, sculptors are savvy enough to understand that if they put some sort of bracelet or thing to cover what would otherwise be a rough transition, it, it not only gives something extra and fun to paint, but it, it aids in, uh, in making that transition sell. This horse leg also is uh, glued in, but it's it's got a much better join and I feel pretty good about it. So I'm not gonna deal with that too much. I think I'm gonna skip to a different brush though. I want something a little bigger. I'm gonna use my fat short brush, which is my um, my weird uh, Escoda, which is like miniature series. So it's a wedge. 
It can carry a little bit more paint. I don't like to use it with really thin paint, so it's pretty good for this. I did just notice a mold line I missed on the inside of this leg, so I'm gonna grab it quick though. But yeah, I have found that, um, whereas in like the days when I was first starting to get better at mini painting, um, you would still find awkward joins like that where the artist had not put something, a detail to cover the awkward join. Nowadays, um, sculptors and mold makers have gotten very sophisticated about both, if the sculptor doesn't plan it that way, the mold maker will cut the model specifically with that in mind so they can minimize mold lines and also like just make it um, a much better join in general when it's put together. Just gonna use my knife and scrape this sucker. I believe this is Bones Black material. The color and the feel of it seems to be so. There we go, that's better. Hello, Razor. Cool, if you're new, welcome to the hobby. It's an awesome hobby. If you have any new questions, uh, new person questions, feel free to ask them. We get a lot of new people on the stream here. And if you're thinking it, chances are somebody else is thinking it too. So never feel bad about asking like what you might think is a noob question because somebody else will always benefit as well as you. And I teach beginners a lot, so. <laughs> Pick one and fire away. We'll talk about it. I like having questions to answer while, especially while I'm base coding here, you know, it's boring stuff, the base coding. It's the most boring stage. So uh, while I am tackling getting my horse brown. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, actually, they're not. Bones. <laughs> so, okay, Razor, here you go. So this guy, like this, this material, this plastic, and it's not just bendy, um, bendy plastic. It actually does have some strength to it. But this is Reaper Bones line. Um, Reaper Miniatures is an American company that I work for and who sponsors this stream, full disclosure. Um, but these plastic models are much cheaper. You can usually get uh, you can usually get a human size model for about what three three or four bucks, right, guys? And if you catch Reaper's Kickstarters, you can get really good deals um, because they launch uh, a lot of models in the core set. And it's like 100 or 120 bucks. It's but you get like at least 40 models, and it usually goes up to about 80 models at the end of the Kickstarter. So it's a really good buy. You can get models in that case for under two bucks a piece, um, including some larger ones. But uh, the bones material lets us because we kickstarted at Reaper, it lets us offer them for a lower price. So and the technology is getting better and better. So as we've been working with the material, we've managed to make it. Um, keep detail better, uh, make it easier to clean the mold lines off and stuff like that. So yeah, Reaper's Bones line. And there are several Bones type of like lines. There's the core Bones line, uh, which is probably the softest. And then there's Bones Black, which is like this guy, it's the gray. And uh, it's a much harder, like I can't really, you can see I can bend this a little bit by putting pressure on it, but not very much. It's actually, it keeps its shape and it keeps good detail. Probably the highest end Bones line is maybe $1 more per model, and that's Bones USA. It's done with completely different technology from the other ones. Uh, I didn't know if it was up to 150 in the core set cursed. It, the first one went very high, but I thought that the number of models that were essentially free, added free to the core set had gone down over time because of costs. Um, the first Bones Kickstarter was ridiculous as far as how many models you got in the set, but I couldn't remember how much. I, you get a lot though. Three to five, yeah, Bones USA goes up by a dollar, probably. So Bones 5 ended up at 150 models for like 120 bucks. Yeah, so under a dollar per mini. But you have to catch those Kickstarters. I believe we are planning, are we planning Bones 6 now? Is that the deal? I'm no longer working at headquarters, so I don't get the updates along with everybody else. And I seldom have time to watch uh, Reaper Live. But usually there's much to do, and if you... Um, 
if you participate or sign on to the Reaper Discord, which is uh, free and everything, you know, you can essentially become a member of the community and be kept up to date. If you get on the Reaper Miniatures Facebook page, that's another way to keep up to date. So really, whatever your social media is of choice, if you keep an eye on it, you will be notified um, when Reaper launches their new Kickstarter. And that's probably the easiest and best way to get a bunch of models for a very low amount of money. Uh, everything on there kind of counts as a pre-order, so you get them for less than retail. Oh, is it? They're actually launching it on the 31st? They're launching it on the day Brandon Sanderson's Kickstarter ends? <laughs> I guess it's totally different audiences, right? Ah, okay. Great. Thanks, Quindy. So yeah, so there, Quindy just gave you a note, uh, a link to get notified when the Kickstarter goes live. The Kickstarter is super fun and it's exciting because it always goes into the millions of dollars. Uh, and there's always fun reveals and neat new models. So, and the community here is awesome. If I, if I do say so myself being somewhat biased, but nonetheless it is. Um, so anyway, if you just want a few models to start out with, and remember you don't need all the models to start out with. You just need a few you really like. Um, then Reaper's Bones, I would say go Bones Black or Bones USA for the finer detail. It's also a little bit easier to clean mold lines. If you are you are a newbie, you, you may not be cleaning mold lines, but essentially the line like the one here on the bicep, if you see it there, that's where the mold came together to make the model. And so there's just a little bit of a ridge there. And I tend to use, on Bones models, I tend to use a knife. Some of them are uh, resilient enough to be okay with files, but I just scrape with the edge of a knife really gently to take those mold lines off. So I find bones and bones or uh, bones black and bones USA are the easiest to clean. And I like to clean up my models so I don't have those ugly lines. And this one, obviously I did not clean up very much. I missed this, uh, I was looking at the horse pieces, I think, and I totally missed the areas on the human form. There. Oh, did we get a, did Margaret get a, did Margaret 24 sub? Oh, hold on, hold on, I missed it. I missed it. It's because I was busy cleaning mold lines and answering questions. Hold on, Margaret, wait, wait, I must scroll up. There it is. There it is. Wow, I really missed that one. So, Margaret, happy 24 months. Double sub anniversary, double sub anniversary, double sub anniversary. Happy double sub anniversary. There you are. And 30 for Motor City Ray. Wow, I haven't seen you in a while, Ray. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, you were too busy spamming commands. So, Quindy and I are both liable. Um, for that one, for missing that double sub anniversary. Alrighty. So we've got some horse bits. Did I miss any horse bits? Uh, I think I'm pretty good. I do need to grab walnut and add the shadows. Remember the bay horse pattern that we are using, uh, has a black mane and tail and black legs. The black legs can also be interrupted via white socks and markings. I love painting horses and I haven't painted one in so long, so I'm maybe having a little bit too much fun with this. <laughs> oh, we're talking about Bone 6, Pendrake, and the fact that apparently they're launching it on uh, the 31st, which is the day, the day the Brandon Sanderson Kickstarter ends. That's actually not a bad choice, even if they didn't plan it that way, because apparently Kickstarter is getting a lot of attention right now because of the Sanderson Kickstarter. Um, and other Kickstarters that are running at the same time as it are benefiting because people are logging into Kickstarter and looking at what's hot. So that's actually, I think, a very uh, great start date. The kitties like when I sing, huh? That's funny. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, business, 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 numbers. Is it working? Silly business. 
So I'm just using walnut for my black. Um, because very few animals in nature are like truly, truly black. Um, so you can use an off black like walnut, which is a, a very, you can see it there. It's a very, 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 very dark brown. We'll put the, bla the black base in so you guys can see with a little bit more. I've got a lot of white palette here, so it's having a hard time overwhelming the white palette. But it is really brown, I swear. It's not black. It just kind of looks it. So I'm using that for my black on the uh, legs. They love a singing in. <laughs> it's because I get all high energy. Someone begged to put it off a week. Yeah, I know. I think that's smart. Like I said, it's like you, you start up on the tail of another big Kickstarter and then maybe you get some extra attention because people are still, you know, paying attention to the Kickstarter. They're going to be looking at the top ratings and that's good. That's faster than I thought. I'll have to, um, I always sub to them, even though I'm a Reaper employee, I always, always throw some money at them because I like to see them do well. So I'll have to see what I really like in this one. Yeah, that's where it uh, helps to join the Reaper Challenge League, uh, Cursed. Join Reaper Challenge League and it'll get you to paint your models faster. If you feel like you still have too many models from the last Kickstarter. But yeah, that's a lot of models. 450 models off of one Kickstarter is pretty atrociously huge. So anyway, I hope that answered the question about where you can find cheap models. Reaper is um, pretty famous for... Uh, trying to keep price points low in the hobby, just so you know. Like ever since the beginning, Ed has tried to really hit a lower price point and make Reaper's uh, stuff accessible. Reaper is not the company that charges you more by how effective your model is in a game, for example. Um, and we try to, I mean, Bones was officially uh, kind of an attempt to uh, provide cheaper models for like paint and takes and stuff. But then the product looks so good, we ended up selling it. There we go. So we've got some nice, you see how nice that, I really love like the fade from the reddish brown part of the horse into the dark socks. I think it's really fancy. Just a little bit. I mean, it's truth. It's not like I'm slandering them. They, they're often, it kind of frustrates me because I, uh, it's just a standard bay cursed. I mean, it's a bay horse. But, uh, so we had all sorts of crazy in there. Going back to, yeah, Razor. So I hope that answered your question, Razor. Um, I don't know of any other companies that are specifically inexpensive. I don't think there, I kind of don't think there are any. Um, like I said, Ed is, our, Ed is our CEO, and he has long made it a quest for Reaper to be accessible and affordable because it only helps the hobby. Uh, but I feel like other companies, many other companies are either boutique companies where they're very small. And so they really have to, they can't afford to price their stuff quite that, that affordably and still make, make a profit. Um, or they're, uh, big, big, big companies, but they're running a game. And so they feel they can afford to price it up because you need the models for the game. Um, and a lot of them have a lot bigger infrastructure too, to pay for. So, you know, Reaper makes an effort though. Reaper really does. Uh, there's a reason I started working for this company. I worked for a different miniature company in the past before Reaper. And there was pretty much a night and day difference. Alrighty. Let's see here. So that's pretty good. I think I want, I want to bring a little shadow into behind this, uh, this haunch. Oh dear. Only if he had a shorter tail, Valandar. Only if he had a shorter tail. All right, so I'm gonna grab maybe some of my dark and then a little bit more walnut. I'm gonna thin those down. I'm gonna just paint in some shadow areas where you can see that they're kind of darker recessed. Like this area behind the front shoulder up against the girth here. Not gonna get much highlight there. 
especially because he's turning and this whole this area is being scrunched so where i just painted is definitely more of a shadow area i also like to kind of define around the shadows and muscle groups here where you can see that the muscles are bunching up i need to move this out of the way so you guys can see a little better There. Taking a little bit more walnut. It's still kind of a mix of walnut and our shadow. I don't want it to go as dark as the legs though. I just want a bit. Yeah, I'm with you, Quinny. Face palm. As we degenerate. So much for useful information. We're done. <laughs> What? You came here for useful information? No, you shall have centaur puns. Curse you and your useful information. I'm gonna make a dark shadow on the belly, just like I left one here. There's a little bit of musculature here, so I'm gonna actually shade around that. Yeah, full dad mode, I agree. Yeah, all right, so, and I wanna get, I do wanna get some shadows over here as well so that we can get the rest of this looking, kind of the, all of the horse bits looking like horse bits. And I've got a little bit of wet paint here, so I'm actually gonna hold off that and I'm gonna concentrate on shading in some of these other areas. We can also use our walnut as a liner to line around the girth and the back piece here. And that counts as additional shading. Liner is just very efficient shading. Uh, nope. The dog that could be the mom of my puppy won't go into heat until April, probably. So there will be no pupper news until April, and that's assuming that she does go into heat then. And then there will be no pupper news until five weeks after that, which will be the ultrasound, roughly. To see if there is um, puppers. The only other proper news is that I'm still going to Canada at the end of this month to do the evaluation on, or help with the evaluation on our Belgian Tavirin outcross puppies who are getting more and more adorable by the day. And they're Kiri great-great-grandkids, so, you know, of course they had to be adorable. So just putting some light, you can see that black line there, even with how dark the horse is, it helps to bring out the details. One second, boom, boom, maybe I can find pictures. Ah, Ah, my, my Wi-Fi is not working. So no puppy pictures without Wi-Fi. Otherwise I would seek to find cute puppy pictures here. Uh, 
Let's see. Oh, and she's actually overdue for new pictures. But here, let me show you my favorite. Here is my favorite. My favorite Kiri great-great-grandchild. He is adorbs. I really like him. He is uh, three weeks old in that picture. But there should be four weeks pictures up. There, are you all happy now you had cute puppy picture? Yeah, Malinois have to be the best trained boys because they're so high drive and so high energy. They are not your average family's dog. They need a job. Yep. So yeah, we have a Malinois in our neighborhood as well that I see and also very, very well-trained dog. If you're gonna own that sort of breed, and the Malinois is a bit higher, a, a bit more hardcore than the Tervuren. There are some Tervurens that are, because it's all it used to be one breed is the Belgian Sheepdog or Belgian Shepherd, but the coat types were separated out into separate breeds and now you get a different level. But the Malinois is used in military work and police work and so it has been bred to keep that high drive and high energy and super focus. It's uh, definitely a working dog. If you want a couch potato dog, do not even look at the Belgian breeds. We actually looked at Turfurens back in the beginning, my ex and I, um, and decided no just because, just based on that. Because at the time we were both couch potatoes and I hadn't weren't looking for a, a dog that was a job, pretty much. There, so you can see the dark line and how that helps bring out everything and separate the saddle from the horse parts. Lining is a way to signal your brain that, that you've moved to a different surface. So that's what makes the horse parts look, will make them uh, continue to look very realistic is getting that separation line in there and doing uh, using very different techniques um, and tighter techniques on all of this armor. Yeah, they also are higher energy, Valandar. Um, Victoria Lamb, sculptor, Victoria Miniatures, she has beardies. They are great dogs, but they take, uh, do, do be aware they need exercise. <laughs> Hello, Space Toy. Yeah, we're working on uh, a centaur. He's closer if he was... Uh, if he was an alone model and not, not a Reaper model, um, he'd be 54 millimeter, but in reality, he is just a centaur. Um, he's about, the horse is scaled correctly. A 28 millimeter could sit on this horse. Like if we had our bunny, our bunny could, could ride this horse. Although she's actually a little bit big, but she still could. Like her legs are long enough that you could put the bunny on the horse. You could, you could cross the streams here. Bunny on horse, it works. Um, but because the horse part is so big, the human the human part is also commensurately big, which I like because I feel like a lot of centaurs suffer from really, not pinhead, but you know, like the human body just feels too small. So. Yeah, they have to be well-trained dogs because they have by their nature, they have a, a lot of energy and a lot of drive and you have to do something with that. If you don't do something with it, you get a destructive dog or a really like just really frustrated dog that's misbehaves. Yeah, this is a good, good sculpt for a centaur. This is part of the Greek Odyssey um, box set from Bones 5. I really liked the Greek models. So uh, we already painted one of them where he's close to done. I don't know if he'll get done, but the bronze golem is another one from that set that we painted on the stream. And the centaur is the one we replaced him with. But yeah, it's a nice model. I don't know what's released for bone from bones five and what's not at this point. So I can't tell you, I don't know if this guy's for sale. 
Quindy, is he? I feel so out of uh, out of touch. Just putting in more shading on the, some of the darker muscle creases on this animal parts. There. He's not. Yeah. Yeah, land shark for sure. With uh, Malinois. But yeah, that's the downside. It's like they're so cute, but without structure, you get a really screwed up dog. That's why there's a lot of uh, publicity out there of don't get a Malinois puppy or why you should not get a Malinois puppy. Most families seem to want a more fire and forget uh, kind of dog. All right, so we've got some of that musculature laid in. Most of the Dungeon Dwellers has been released and that's it. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, with supply and all that, I can see why it's taking a while with some of these guys to get restocked or stocked or released. Like, it's been a long time. When was the last Kickstarter? Like, was it right? I can't remember if it was right after I moved. I feel like it was. Critico. <laughs> well, nobody ever said that humans were really, you know, tuned into what's best for themselves. <laughs> nobody ever said that. <laughs> You think you want one until your dog is a psycho and you don't know how to fix it. <laughs> All right, so now let's bring up these highlights a bit because you can see that I've got a lot lighter color here than I do here. So I am going to strengthen up my ruddy leather a little bit. And the reason that I am going to strengthen it a little bit more and not just use it four to one, um, or I think I was actually a two to one, uh, is that it's so close to the shadow color. So I want just a little bit more strength in it. I'm going to drop a water into it. It was a two to one. Now I'll be more like a uh, five to two. Ah, bones fight. Yeah, I was I was looking for launch date. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, he is twisted oma. That's why the blanket is started on the back. It's going to be an Appaloosa. Uh, he'll have white socks too. I just haven't gotten around to blocking those in. And I may extend the uh, blanket a little bit. I haven't painted a horse for forever and it'll probably be forever again until I get to paint another one on this stream. So since it doesn't often, you know, we don't have a lot of mounted models and I tend not to paint monsters, animal monsters very much just because they tend to be like one set of techniques. But this guy's got all sorts of stuff we can do on him, plus he has horse bits. So yeah, I decided I had to do something like really cool. So we're gonna get that bright red color. This is what the ruddy leather is really, really good for is that bay horse, red brown, really rich coloration. Um, and even though I'm not gonna be showing my brush strokes, I'm still moving my brush in a way that it's in the direction that hair would grow. It's just a good habit to get into when painting animals because that way if you do ever leave brush strokes, it looks intentional. It doesn't uh, fight with anything. I'm gonna leave that shadow right behind the shoulder there though because that probably would be in shadow. So that's a beautiful red color, red brown. And I 
want to get a little bit on the interior of the leg there. I know what I should be doing. I should be putting my uh, base behind the model so that you guys can see it a little bit. That'll lighten him up a little bit and let you see the details a bit more. But you can see that beautiful red, brown, rich coloration. It's just, this is a very good color if you're starting out, if you're trying to do a dark chestnut colored horse or if you're trying to do this red, brown, bay color. Um, it's just, it really is the color for this. Yeah, but we don't paint them on here. Like there's, there aren't that many um, and most of the time it's not what I would reach for to paint on stream because like I said, I like to be able to give you guys a number of like techniques and different cover a number of things over the course of a model and a horse is pretty much just horse, horse hair and pattern, which is why the centaur is a nice thing to use so that not only do you get the horse painting tutorial, but you also get all the other stuff. That's why I don't just grab like some of the animals from Dark Heaven to paint those. I just feel like the number of techniques I can show on them is very limited. Yeah, skeletons are even worse. Like, there's exactly one thing you can usually like show on skeletons. Maybe two if they have like armor and weapons. And that's, you know, you can show painting bone and you can show painting corroded like armor and weapons. But most Reaper skeletons don't have a lot of armor. I always liked uh, companies that did do skeletons that had a lot like, that pretty much had their armor like still on but rotting off of them. I always liked that look for skeletons. It made them a lot less generic and more interesting. But it wasn't really the style that a lot of D&D people want, and so Reaper didn't really go in that direction with most of their skeletons. The problem, the reason we don't do more horsey type stuff, Kurniko, is that it doesn't sell. Reaper has experimented with it numerous times in the past, and for every every person who says, oh, but I want, you know, a mounted version of my character, and the problem there is we've got, you know, a thousand models out, and we can't put out a thousand versions of mounted versions of those models. Still all comes down to painting bone and then you're just the window dressing cursed. We have the different bone triads to help you paint something that's more fresh, like yellow bone versus rotting bone, which is kind of the original bone triad. I did it that way on purpose because I found that most bone triads were too, too yellow or too bright for me. I wanted something that felt more like gray rotting bone. Uh, so that's why that first triad is that color. And then we went more traditional with the uh, the ivory triad, which stained ivory is now uh, canceled, but gnawed bone from the fast palette is a good replacement. In fact, it's probably a little better replacement. Like, I feel like I like gnawed bone a little bit better. It's a little more versatile overall. Now I'm bringing my highlights in just on these red parts. And again, I'm always going to be doing brush strokes in the direction that the hairs would be growing. But that picks up that horse color all through. It is such a pretty, pretty horse color. Well, I mean, I'm giving you a horse painting tutorial right now, so you shouldn't be sad. You should be happy that I figured out how to do a horse painting tutorial without painting just a horse. I am uh, destroying this Da Vinci. I'm just noticing that it... Uh, is definitely degenerating quickly. I must have uh, abused this one a bit more than even usual. I 
Yep, although this is, of course, uh, being a bay horse, depending on what color your character's horse is. But as always, the best thing I can say is if you're going to be painting an animal, get a photo reference. At the When we started this model, I went and did show various pictures of bay horses and did settle on a color that I wanted from among those pictures. So... I cannot believe that it is quite that bad, Kernico. Unicorns are difficult because they're almost always white, and white is um, a difficult color. However, if you really want a good unicorn, tu unicorn tutorial, you should actually look at what we did yesterday with the silver blue um, up to white hair on the mage that we are working on. Because I mentioned in that stream, I believe that this would be a good way to bring up unicorn coloration. But yeah, where a lot of people, I think, where they fail on horses is they don't pay attention to the hair direction. They don't use a finer brush stroke or a finer brush. They just kind of block things in and expect them to work. Um, but that's not really how things work. And if you want uh, a horse that really looks realistic, you've got to pay attention to muscle masses. And remember that the horse in general isn't going to be a black to white highlight color scheme, but it's also not going to be like all one blocky color. You do want to bring out shadows and highlights. Alrighty, let's see here. Yeah, that's pretty much got my highlights down. Looking pretty okay. Um, I won't bring the highlights up farther on the horse here until I've got a lot more painted in, but I do want to work on the Appaloosa pattern, and I also want to um, get some stockings started on this horse. Cool as it is to, like... Uh, leave the legs black actually it is pretty cool so i could i could hold off um figuring out if i want to add stockings i'm pretty sure i do on at least one hoof but i probably should hold off on that because adding a white sock is going to be um, kind of distracting it's going to draw the eye visually so if i wait until i've blocked in some of the rest of this then i can uh pick uh the place where a white accent would be good I'm kind of thinking that this hoof is probably the one I want it on because it's the hoof that's like kicking uh, and striking, but it may not work out that way. So I'm going to call that. I need a little bit more information. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's, the silver blue underpaint is very um, magical, so it's better for unicorns. Um, but essentially you want to just start out with a color around that kind of shade range. Like, so I think I made that mixing a gray with a blue and the gray was fairly dark. But you want to start, you want to start pretty dark. So like if you're doing... A kind of a creamy white horse 
I would start probably mixing an odd bone and creamy ivory, like get something that's kind of darker than you think, because you need the contrast. You want to start usually in the shadow and bring it up. In my experience, never start white. Like we'll start with a white primer, but then paint over it with a, with a medium toned paint. You can also use something like, um, actually a great one would be like desert sand to bring that up to white. Um, cause it's a bit of a brown under layer or that plus gray would be good. No, I'm doing the, I'm working on the Appaloosa Pendrake. Working on the Appaloosa pattern. I just dragged my palette down here so I could show you guys which colors I was grabbing. So grabbing a brush full of that and a brush full of that. I think it may be a little bit more. And then I used Cairnstone as my first, as my white, my off-white. So one drop of this, because I wanted to bring it up kind of a roan color. So that means that this faded reddish pinkish gray almost, that's how um, the first stages tend to look. And then you bring it up a little bit more. And then I'm gonna use the walnut for spots in it. So I'm building a couple transitions here. So we can bring up the blanket a bit more. Still a little bit, yeah, that's good. But from there I need to bring it up not pink. So I'll be using probably Cairnstone. Maybe I'll use um, a bit of creamy ivory with that to bring it a little more yellow since Cairnstone is a little bit gray. And I'll probably do the spots first, and I'll do that for a very specific reason. Alrighty. So I've kind of got a line up here with the starting color and then working. I might, may or may not use this color. We'll find out. Yeah, thanks for the sub. Uderfricht. Uderfricht. I don't know how to say your name. Uder. Udir will be your um, your shortened name. It says Anne doesn't know how to pronounce things like that. I have slaughtered names. It's kind of a thing. I do it. So since since the uh, I have carefully managed people's expectations as far as my slaughterage of names. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I see Elder Scrolls. I've only played, I played a little bit of Morrowind, a tiny bit, but the combat system was hard for me. And then I did Skyrim, which I enjoyed. I think everybody did. So I'm gonna um, bring down the blanket a little bit, a little bit more coverage, uh, a little bit more over this muscle. Yeah, I think you're right, Karu. I'm known for it because I do the award ceremony at ReaperCon every year for the painting competition, and uh, I am stellar at mangling names. And then, you know, right when I learn people's names, they tend to get married or something or divorced, and then I have to relearn their new name. Silly people. All right, so yes, yeah, so I'm expanding my speckles, my blanket here, down a bit. That's nice, I like that. That's a good look. Um, and I'm gonna take this middle light color and make sure I've got 
some specks kind of out from that. Ah. Yeah, and this is only the beginning of the speckling. The speckling will continue because I'm, I'm also doing kind of a brush stroke for fur. But uh, the speckling will also continue beyond this because I'm going to introduce some darker spots. So I wanted to bring down a couple of spots coming out from this. Kind of like that. <laughs> Name language is just what it is. All right, so now that I've got kind of um, the spots and speckles laid out a bit better here, maybe I'll get another one right down here. And when I'm putting these in, notice I'm not just putting a blob in. I'm doing numerous brush strokes, and all of those brush strokes are directionally with the direction of the hair, the way the hair grows. This helps them look like they are integrated with the hair and not... Ah, uh, no, Marmundo. I just wanted something back here to give the viewer something to look at to show that it's not just a block painted horse. I wanted to try an Appaloosa pattern because I hadn't done one for a very long time. Um, I hadn't ever done one on a bay horse. So this is, uh, I don't, I won't do it on the human. I don't think he's got enough going on. If I do anything on him, it'll be tattoos, like a tattoo on this arm probably because stylistically it fits. Um, and I've got a lot of kind of swirly designs here that I could base the tattoo off of. But I think it's better to, to keep the Appaloosa on the horse. If he was a planar human part, then maybe. But a lot of his, like, it would be on the back, if anywhere, and the, the mane covers a lot of this, so... Alrighty, I want to block in um, some dark spots. So I'm going to grab my walnut and my initial color. I'm going to thin it a bit. Um, the reason I'm thinning all this stuff is so that I can get that brush stroke going on. It's hard to it's hard to do the hair texturing if you don't have thinner paint because you need thinner lines to do it. So now I want to do kind of a reverse and add in some darker spots. And once again, same direction, brush strokes, same direction as hair. If I don't like this effect, then I'll go back and get rid of them. It's the easiest thing in the world to wipe these out if they're not working. This is fun though. And I think I want to get a little bit more, a couple of bigger spots, and a couple of little spots. The uh, key with any spot pattern is to make the spots irregular and make sure that you are not making them all the same size. Because on an animal, they are not uniform. <laughs> I do everything, Uter. I, uh, I'm, uh, I've been painting a very long time. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Let's just go there. Um, I don't think I've got any other tattoo models, but 
if you look at, wait a minute. Let me just make sure I've got my internet address right. Okay, so my website is paintingbig.net. So just like that, painting big, all one word. And uh, let's see here, we've got our gallery. If we go to menu and we go to gallery, cause I just did my, redid my website. Then I do have a tattoo model down through here. Let me see. It's a bunch of stuff that I've done. Ah, there we go. Dark elf, dark elf had a dragon tattoo. I repeated it on the base and reverse, but I wanted to do, and he had a bit of it extending to his back as well. But yeah, so I've done tattoos before. That's paintingbig.net. I don't have everything up on my gallery yet, but most of the stuff I'm proud of, I've gotten up on my gallery. Thank you, Quindy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to do dragon. That's a um, that's a Hera models H E R A models. Um, academic bust. Academic busts are a great way to start trying some bigger models, some bigger busts, because they they are meant to be very simple. They're created actually for use in classes and such, which is why they're called academic busts. Um, just starting to bring up some color here, uh, and so they're it's a it, because they're so simple. You can do things like tattoos and freehand and all that stuff. It works really well on them because you're not fighting a lot of intrinsic detail on the bust itself. I'm going to switch over to my off-white. I'm going to thin it way down, though, this uh, Creamy Ivory and Karen Stone mix that I have. I probably want it at around one-to-one. -one. I want to start bringing it up. I'll leave a little bit of the roan color here and there because it actually does, uh, it stays on bay horses. Let's see if I can find my photo reference to show you. Let me see if I can find a good example. I think that's the one I was looking at. Yeah. So on this bay, Appaloosa, you can see that roan pattern. You can see that pink. Um, and then the white takes over a lot of the hide. So that's what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be bringing up my white a bit to bring this up. Um, this bay horse also has the white socks, even though the, the legs go to black, then they go up to white. But this is the, this is why we're starting where we're starting. You can also see that some of the spots are actually darker than the ground color of the horse. So these are actually almost black. They've got a much darker. There are some that are more brown, um, but that you can get that. So let me see. I've got, see, I think that's the best picture that I have. That's the one I based this uh, pattern on. Yeah, have a good one, Space Toy. The thing about tattoos is to always use thinned paint when you're putting them on, like glazes, because you want the skin tone to ideally show through. You don't want them to be very solid. Um, and then to glaze over the top of them with the skin tone when you're done. So let's bring up this white, this blanket, and just leave a little bit of roaning here and there. Now this is why all my spots are going in the direction of the hair. It's why I used the same brush stroke for all this, is now when I bring this white in, I can kind of keep, take the edges of this white, these white brush strokes and drag them over the edge of the spot. And that's gonna integrate the spot with the uh, hair direction of the white. It's gonna make everything look like it belongs together instead of making it look like the spots were just dropped onto the blanket in big blobs. So we're bringing up that blanket. Yeah, Karu, if you can do the freehand or if you've got a pattern, sometimes you can find people who have done, who have uh, 
taken like a design like that and made it kind of a decal that you can paint over if you're not a good freehand artist but if you are a freehand artist then that's always preferable to do your own I think it makes it more unique gosh knows there's enough examples of pinup nose art out there to draw from draw inspiration from so I'm gonna bring up this white, these white spots a lot now, a lot lighter, less roni. I used that to kind of figure out my pattern, but now just like on our photo reference, um, those were pretty bright white when you get down to this point, you see more roning around the spots. So this is where it pays to pay attention to your photo reference so that you are, or so that your stuff looks realistic if you want it to. And when you're doing animals and you're trying to make them look real, um, or at least make the colors look real or, you know, then it pays to pay attention to this sort of thing. And here I'm doing kind of both dots and dashes. Because I'm liking this little kind of snowflakey detail I'm getting. With freehand, start with basic shapes and then work up from there. Basic shapes and borders with simple shapes in them. Once you get comfortable, realize that all freehand is like just patterns and you can learn a lot just by looking for kind of the hidden geometric shapes in the shapes that you're looking at. Even the complex shapes can be broken down into simple geometrics. So now we're starting to get this uh, really coming up here. And remember there's a little bit of a darker stripe down the back and I'll be trying to keep that actually. I like the dorsal stripe, even though it's technically like you can see it on a bay and you may not see it on a bay, but I, I think it's going to be on this horse. So you see it a lot more on buckskins, lighter bays, you see that dark dorsal stripe, but I like the look. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to preserve it. We all look like that in the beginning, dog father. Everybody looks like a two-year-old with a crayon in the beginning. Those of us who like are further along, just, you know, we're actually doing that when we were two-year-olds and we, you know, kept drawing and developing, you know, cause we were interested in it, but it can be taught. Anybody can learn. Simple freehand can be learned by anyone. The only differentiator in this hobby is how much effort and love you're willing to put into it. And I guess, you know, how much you believe. But that's the great thing about Reaper being such an encouraging community is if you, if you want to believe in yourself, but you have trouble doing it, as so many of us do, there are always people in our community who will believe in you for you. That's one of the things I love about you guys. You believe in each other. And this is such a big thing in the world. See, I'm getting very fine lines here, which is beautiful. I love that. That's why I love these brushes, this, the Da Vinci's. Once they're broken in, they give you, let's see if I can get in. Where's my focal length? There it is. They give you some beautiful fine strokes. And I'm, I will admit that I am definitely playing and trying to get pretty fine with these markings. It's a big horse, so I have the room to do it. It is time and effort, yep. 
Well, but there's practice and there's practice. Two, that's another thing to understand if you ever decide you want to get better at, at something in this. It's, it's not just doing it, but it's doing it like with the intent of getting better, analyzing your results, figuring out where things went wrong, and then trying again with that in mind. And it's not just doing like everything. This is why I, yeah, so I advise you guys to like concentrate on one thing at a time. Concentrate on one technique at a time. It's very difficult to do. So many of us just want to, you know, run forward and dive in. And that's cool too. I mean, that's the fun of it. So that's coming up very nicely. I like this a lot. Um, as I get closer to the dorsal stripe, I can go a little darker with my spots. Yep. Yeah, that can work great, Margaret. It sounds great. I mean, it's just the same. Um, yeah, if you... Uh, like if you've got stock photos and cobbled together something and then painted over it digitally, you know, right? It's kind of the same idea. And doing that will still teach you a bit about, you know, painting landscapes. So everybody struggles with wings cursed, both because most wings are not sculpted realistically and because wings are just a pain in the butt to paint. That's why you should go watch the Sphinx um, VOD. When I did Sphinxy, we did a lot of wings. We talked about wings and how to do wings and we did wings. So if you have trouble with wings, you should go talk to Sphinxy or at least watch her VODs or in this case, her YouTube videos because she's been done for a while. But Sphinx is definitely the video where I did the most in-depth wings. It's uh, kind of the slow version of wings as opposed to the quick and dirty version of wings. Gonna add in a little bit. I think I wanna thin this down a little though. When I'm adding in something like a dorsal stripe where it's really gotta fade in and blend in then I want to have a much thinner paint, much more subtle line. But yeah, definitely go, if you have trouble with wings, go watch the, the Sphinx stuff. I don't know when I'm going to do wings again or if I'm going to do wings again because I... Uh, it is a pain. It's a pain in the butt. Wings are my least favorite thing to paint in all of um, painterdom. So because of that, it's rare for me to tackle wings, but because I loved Julie and Bob's, or I guess it's just Julie's Sphinx so much, um, I wanted to paint that model despite the wings. But it means you guys might not get another uh, wing lesson for quite a long time. So darkening down the dorsal stripe there. And by doing that, I get license to darken down these spots. But yeah, I don't know a single, uh, a single person, a single painter, certainly not any single high-end painter who enjoys painting wings. Mostly because uh, when you get to a certain level of painter, you understand what a pain in the butt they are and they never look as good as you want them to. With the exception, like now, I guess there's a specific sculpting style I like on, on wings, but it's a sculpting style you're usually not going to encounter um, in 28 millimeter and certainly not for gaming models, which is more what Reaper does. But it's kind of where the, where the individual feathers details aren't filled in. It's just the shape of the feather and they're mostly flat with a little bit of detail. That's actually the type of feather I prefer because I can do more patterning. It's I'm not limited by the sculpted texture, but most painters want sculpted texture because they'd be lost without it. So it, it really varies. Wings, the design of wings really varies. 
Yeah, Julia's uh, spoken up about that in the past because she sculpted a lot of wings. That wings are a pain in the butt. All right, so we've got the side of this looking pretty good, guys. Like these are maybe, these spots are maybe a little uniform. So I'm going to come in and make this one littler, maybe split it in two. Because the more irregular the shapes of the spots are, the more real this looks. You see that? Once I split up and minimize that spot so it wasn't the same size as these two spots, I got uh, definitely a, a bigger return here. So now it looks like just a little organic grouping of spots. And because I have brush strokes that are going kind of into the spot, like white brush strokes going into the dark spot and vice versa, that makes it look like it's really growing out of the hair. It's organic. It's not just a spot that's painted on as a spot. And that's the most important thing if you learn nothing else about painting natural animal patterns. When you are doing spots and stripes, that is how it should look. Um, you should have that fade from the regular color into the pattern color, even if it's very slight and only in a few places. If you have it at all and you keep your brush strokes in the correct fur direction, it's going to look 50 times more real. Yeah. Oh, like painting them freehand? Yeah, there's a there's a knack to wings. I mean, the um, Space Marine iconography really keeps it very simple. I don't know about that, Gru. I have no urge to paint Grim Talon. That, that model is pretty much the antithesis of anything Anne would like not paint. Because it's all wings and it's all feathers. But yeah, the key here is really fine brush. Really fine brush. Remember how the hair grows. If you have to look at, if you're not sure what direction the hair is growing on your horse, grab a cat. Kurniko and look at your cat because the horse the horse and the cat they're gonna the same the fur is gonna grow the same same direction you're gonna be able to see that all right other side and I think I want to block in some spots and I want to have one spot kind of going up over into here a couple of spots here actually up on top Because we can't be too orderly with these spots. They must be chaotic and irregular. Everything in our talk of bone six and much horse painting. We have all the rest of our horsey bits uh, colored in and we have gotten the Appaloosa blanket more or less done on one side. Oh, was it really not much cursed? I don't know. It felt like a bit. Or are you trolling? And again, down here, I want to kind of bring in a little bit further down of pattern. More spots, more spots. It's like more dots, only more spots. And I'll get a bit more little dots and spots. I could have on the other side as well. I think that's about right. It's a little bit more speckly than the other side, but we'll, or a little less speckly, but we'll, we'll get there. There we 
we are. So now we have our spots figured out. We're going to go and take that off white that we've mixed with Cairn Stone and Creamy Ivory and thinned way down. Although now it needs a little bit more water. I'm very persnickety about my paint consistency when I'm layering up with a white or an off white because it has to do what I want it to do. And it did exactly what I wanted it to do on this other side. So now enough time has passed that my paint is thickening just a tad. I don't want that. So I dropped a little more water into it. Very little paint on the brush. Unload your brush. Remember that even very thinned white is still pretty strong. And start building it up. And the spots right now are placeholders and I'll be elaborating on them as I go. And remember, we want to keep this dark dorsal stripe here. So I'm actually going to kind of go around the edge of that and map that in so that I don't accidentally paint over it. You can still see the spots in it, which is good. And I'm going to go over the edges of these dark spots with a little bit of my white to bathe them in. And in areas where I feel like the spot is a bit small, I might be very gentle with that, or I might take some of the dark and actually fade it into the white instead. Hopefully it gives you better control, Thormel. That's the reason for it. Especially when you're doing little fine details like this. So where I'm doing where the blanket is more solid, I'm doing more longer brush strokes, although not terribly long because this is very short fur. And that's one thing to remind you guys of when you are painting fur. If the fur is long, use a longer brush stroke. If the fur is short, use shorter dashes. That's going to give you a realistic appearance. So I'm kind of looking forward to the New Bones Kickstarter because like I'm not at headquarters anymore, guys. That means every level is going to be a surprise. I haven't seen anything. I won't have seen anything. Unlike the last one where I had seen a lot of the models come in. I get to experience it like you guys experience it. It's pretty cool. Short little brush strokes, remember. Short hair, short little brush strokes. If you're painting a horse that's in winter coat or that has a shaggier coat with, um, and you could do that with this one because they're definitely this horse has some feathers going on on the, on the legs. Um, then you can use longer brush strokes and it'll help you to establish a more shaggy look for the horse. They definitely have longer coats in winter if they're kept outside at all. Like if they have substantial time outside and are not in a heated environment or a tropical setting. So a little bit more of a broken up blanket on this side and that's entirely in keeping with an Appaloosa. You aren't going to get um, symmetry. So, and it lets me experiment a little bit more with more of a filled in blanket over here with just the little speckles, but on this side, more of a broken up blanket, which I actually, I really like this effect. And if I do another Appaloosa, say a larger piece, cause I do have some mounted figures, big ones. Um, I would be tempted to do that sort of patterning. I think I like this broken up blanket pattern quite a bit.
No, the closest you get is sometimes like on the faces of wolves where you can see like that, you know, from side to side, they're, they're sometimes a bit more symmetrical as far as the eye markings and such. But uh, otherwise, yeah, symmetry is just not a thing in nature, really. Not real, not perfect symmetry, never perfect. So little little differences are nice. Bringing in this uh, higher white now on these little little kind of flea bitten little ticks. Just still bring in that kind of scattered and look at how using a different size of dot here makes this look more organic and natural. <laughs> my cat, my black cat had uh, white hairs on him that were not symmetrical. So just a little bit of speckling out here. And keep in mind, I haven't really even brought this up really close to a bright white. It's still like this off-white color, like this. But it looks white, and the reason that it looks white is it's the lightest thing on the model thus far. It's the closest thing to white. I do need to make it more solid and lose a little bit more of the roan. So that's the matter of just slowly working it up. In reality, it wouldn't take too long because the white is high coverage, all it takes is another couple layers. Still being careful though, not, don't wanna wipe out my texture, don't wanna wipe out the markings. And I do wanna leave a little bit of the roan color here and there because that's natural, that happens. But I would probably take this off white and mix it with a little bit more pure white to um, bring up the pattern a bit more. I consider it paybacks when like wild and semi-wild animals break stuff that humans own. <laughs> We've broken a lot of the stuff they own. <laughs> oh, poor wild animals. Alrighty, so just a little bit of, that's a little bit too regular up here. I need to combine that, there we go. That looks nice, that looks really nice. Actually, I like this a lot. So yeah, I could just continue to layer up this color just a little bit until I felt like I had a really nice solid blanket or I could leave it more of the roan pattern. You can see that it, it is pretty equal on both sides. It's just different pattern. This is, I think, a fairly realistic Appaloosa pattern. So, and we've done our, uh, we, and that's a perfect place to end the stream, actually. Yep, <laughs> I just saw your time quest, time check, Quindy. Yeah, but this is perfect. I have to, I have a bunch of stuff to get done before the dentist appointment later. So, you know, staying on track is good. So what we did today, we finished out our horse and we talked about the colors we used. We talked a bit about Bones 6, which apparently is launching at the end of this month. Put it on your calendar. Be excited. New minis. Yay. It's just a checkup. I used to fear the dentist, but, and then I had a lot of surgeries, HM Road Dog, and I no longer fear the dentist. <laughs> Once you've been through multiple surgeries, the dentist was like, what can you do to me? <laughs> uh, and I mean, I've had my wisdom teeth that had to be broken out under anesthesia. So yeah. Yeah, so the dentist uh, has no fears. It's just annoying because it disrupts my day. 
Yes, and that's what we did. So then, and then we went in and we finished out our Appaloosa pattern more or less. I may, again, I'll lighten it up a bit. It's looking a little lighter on camera than it looks in person. Um, but uh, yeah, I have no idea about the Reaper ships. Like, Karu, the big thing about whether Reaper continues to do big stuff like that is if it's sold. If, uh, if the numbers justify um, adding to it. That's Reaper as always. Remember, it's run by accountants. That's why we're still in business. <laughs> so Reaper will be looking at like, you know, stuff that, that they'll be looking at what works and what doesn't work. So we'll see. I'm not sure how the, how the ships actually sold in the end. But yeah, so, oh, you, yeah. Yeah, it is expensive. Yeah, I have, I have dental insurance, but yeah. But anyway, so that's what we did today, guys. We did our black socks and we did our horse color. And I talked about the colors we used for this beautiful bay coloration again. Uh, and then we fill, filled out the Appaloosa Sweet. So uh, next time I think we'll actually start on a different part of the mini. We might, we're might we going to have to do some green work, as I mentioned, up here. Because this is terrible. This is just a terrible join. So we'll probably do some green work next time. And then if we do paint something, it'll have to be something that's not the green work. So maybe we'll start on the blanket on the back. Plus the girth. Maybe we'll do some more patterns. And we'll highlight the mane and tail and the, the black parts. Um, which do need a bit of highlighting. Um, yeah, so we'll do something like that. We'll probably, we'll do some green work though, because I want to get that done so that we can move on on the model. Thanks everybody for tuning in for the day. Tomorrow, we're back to Bunny. She's coming along really nicely. I wanted to bring up her, we need to work on her blue. We need to work and bring up her violet red color a bit. Um, and I'll start blocking in some other stuff on her as well. But uh, yeah. She's coming along well, and uh, I'm very happy with her. So we will continue work on the hair folk. Yes, that's tomorrow. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, I will see you later. Have a great one. Oh, no problem. This was fun. I like painting horses. It's super fun. Bye, guys.